We are blessed with holidays which people around the world know about. Your journey to find your true identity was both challenging and profound. Her sleeping son was claimed, framed, shamed and renamed and every dream from then on defiled. You can hide your name, you can change your name, but you cannot run away from it. The Emperor's doctor was adopted and had an experience similar to mine. When you share what you have not had, sometimes it helps people to realize what, what they have. Judging or yeah. saying, if, yeah. you know, if he had done this instead of this, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. even to ourselves. Manama, manama. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is to love, be loved in return. Nkwana Derasachu, Melkam Baal. Good afternoon. This is your Pan African show called Africa with your host, Katsala Rukseifu. First of all, I would like to apologize to our audience because usually in the holidays we speak in Amharic. But I have gotten this amazing opportunity to talk to a great poet that is going to be speaking in English. Therefore, we have made this show in English, so I hope you don't mind. Welcome to our show. Thank you for inviting me here. It's an honor. Thank you again for coming. Our guest today is Lemon Sisai. He's a poet who is an Ethiopian, but resides in London. Can I say that? Yes, you can say that. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes. So, Lemon, first, welcome to Ethiopia. Welcome to our show. If you could please give us a little history about you, who you are, how you came to who you are today. My name is Lemon Sisai. Brilliant. Uh, I was born in England. I was stolen from my mother, whose name was Yemareshet Sisai. And uh, I had my name changed. I did not know I was Ethiopian. Yes, and I was in a little village in, in England with white uh, foster parents who changed my name and this meant that I did not know that I was Ethiopian. I did not know who my mother was or my father or my sisters and brothers. I then went into children's homes for, for five years and then at 18 years of age, I began the search for my family. That was when you knew who you were? I knew my name. Okay. I had a different name as a child. I was, I was illegally, they changed my name. Yeah. Then at 18, I, was, I saw my name written on the birth certificate. And uh, I then searched for my mother and father and sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles and cousins. And I spent my adult life searching for my family, I guess. Mm. I'm a writer. Mm. I write books and plays, make BBC documentaries. <laughs> Your journey to find your true identity was both challenging and profound. How did the discovery of your birth name and reconnecting with your mother influence your sense of self and your poetry? Wow. Our names are very important and they have a story in them. And they are told in a language which is our mother tongue and Although I was stolen from my mother, my name has her mother tongue, Lemon Sisai. You cannot run away from your name. You can hide your name, you can change your name, but you cannot run away from it. The sleeping son was claimed, framed, shamed and renamed, and every dream from then on defiled. So when I found my name, when I was 18, I saw the birth certificate, which was from when I was a baby. It said, Lemon Sisai. I took the name. I said, this is my name. This is who I am. You claimed it. Yeah, yeah. This is the truth. Yeah. Lemon. I saw my mother's letters when I was a child, pleading for me back to the social worker. How can I get Lem back? I want him to be with his own people, in his own country, I don't want him to face discrimination. 
She said that in 1968. So yeah, finding my identity or knowing who I am, that's all. It's the same for all of us, you know. Knowing who you are in the world is very important. Absolutely, I do agree. Yeah. In your memoir, My Name Is Why, you describe the emotional impact of finally obtaining your childhood records from the social services. How did this documentation shape your understanding of your past and your advocacy for children in care? The documents were uh, reports that were written about me every three months from the day I was born until I was an adult at 18 years of age. I had no family, so I had no record of me through people. Exactly. That's what your family is. It's a group of records with different people. And you say, what was I like when I was 10 years of age? And your sister might say, ah, oh, you were, uh, you know, and your mother will say, well, you were, uh, and your father may say, you were, you know, so you, you, have, these, different you have these different records, but I didn't have that. So I've had these written documents of 18 years of life on earth. Those documents, they showed me what they did. They said, we must not tell him about his mother. They even wrote that. Yeah, yeah, it's in, it's in writing. They said, you know, his name is Norman. They said he is a naughty boy. They said all of these things that were not true, you see? And when I, when I got the files, was 2015 when I got the files? Wow. Yeah. I then called a lawyer and I took the government to court mm. for stealing me from my mother, for imprisoning me as a child, that's what they did, for stealing my name, for taking my name from me. Uh, yeah. As a poet and an advocate, how do you balance the personal aspects of your story with the broader societal issues you address, such as? Okay. Can I stop for a yeah. minute? Can I just say that your great-grandfather was uh, a doctor and your great-grandfather was also adopted? Yes. And I've heard about your great-grandfather for many years now. People have told me about the doctor who was the doctor for the emperor. The emperor's doctor was adopted and had an experience similar to mine. Yes, he did, actually. I've heard about him for years. So it's really great to kind of meet you because you are his great-granddaughter. His name was Hakim Warkana Eshate. Hakim Warkana Eshate. And the same thing happened to him. The people that actually took him when the queen stated that she didn't want him, but she just wanted Prince Adamayo and the mother, he was taken to India. Wait a minute. Can I just hear this really clearly from you? Queen Victoria in England, he was going to be taken to, to her. Exactly. So this is the late 1800s. But instead... They, she rejected him. She rejected him, so he did meet her. No, no, no. I don't know how they contacted yes, her from... Yes, yes, you yes. Know, but he, they were told to bring the prince and his mother to her. Yes. And she did not care what happened to him. So the captain, who was an Indian captain man... Captain Speedy. ...took him to India. And, and it, what's interesting yes. is he was also named after them. His first name was Charles Martin till he also found out his name, by the way. <gasps> so your great-grandfather thought his name was Charles Martin until he found his name, which was... Warkana Eshate. Warkana Eshate. Yes. Wow. I know. So this naming and taking of the name is something that's happened for many, many years, yeah. particularly with the English. But what is incredible about this is that your grandfather was around at the same time as Prince Alamayhu, who was stolen from, from Ethiopia, yep. from Magdala in the late 1800s and taken. By the way, there were lots of other things stolen. Absolutely. You know, the Queen's yes. Tirana, Tirana, her clothing is in the British Museum. 
So you're a relative of somebody who was adopted at that time. So for me to be doing this interview on this day in Fasika in Ethiopia is quite uh, meaningful for me. And this story of the doctor, the emperor's doctor, which he became, who was also adopted, who had his name changed and then claimed his own name, Wurkana um, Eshete, is a, a miracle. And I think when we, on this day in particular, you know, but when we find our stories and we find our names and what they mean, we look back and we find each other. So I find him and I will speak of him and I will tell his story and other people will hear that and they'll tell his story. I know he's famous here in Ethiopia, but he's also going to be famous in other parts of the world as we speak of him out there, mm -hmm. as we carry stories. And it's, it is all about carrying our stories. Absolutely. Thank you for mentioning No, it's important. It's, it, it truly is. And because when we now talked about it and as we're, even as I'm telling you about the names, it's just clicking. I'm sitting here with you. Yeah. And you've had that same experience. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I never actually absolutely. saw it that way till we actually had this conversation. Absolutely. That's right. It's personal, it's historical, it's cultural, absolutely. it's social, it's political, it's all of those things. This is family. This is what it's about, you know? And this is what we, we carry stories. Those stories change and grow. We see each other over time. We don't recognize each other at certain times. And then we do. And then we do recognize each other, you know. Absolutely. It's By the way, when he first came, he was uh, as Emenilik's doctor. So when your so great-grandfather first came, he was Menelik's yes. doctor. Yes, when he first came. And then came was it the emperor's, Emperor Haile Selassie's yeah. doctor and then as well? He, yeah. My gosh. Yeah. That's quite incredible. Can we talk about here? Because Hilton. we are at the Hilton Hotel. Yes. Which is also very historical. Yeah, and it's historical and it's personal for me because my father was a pilot for Ethiopian Airlines, so he partied here. Okay. Okay, yeah. in the 1960s. But he also, um, my, my, my mother, who married Ashinafi Shifaro, her name was Yamareshet Sisai, they had their wedding party yeah. here mm -hmm. as well afterwards. This is what I was told. And so this place, the Hilton Hotel, has an extremely special place in my heart. I think in all of us, because we yeah. all grew up at Hilton. Yeah. All of our graduations were at Hilton. Yes, We okay. all partied here. Yeah. <laughs> so it definitely does. And then we also found out that what we see in the background, the way, the way they've actually made the hotel, yeah. there's a lot of significance in either the the designs yes. above us or the Fasiladas wall behind yes. us, yes. the Aksum. Yes. So we actually love the idea that we are underneath here. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely the perfect, the perfect place to be. Absolutely. Okay, so we can go back. So you know what no, I want to ask? No, let's not, like, you know, let's exactly. Go, let's roll with it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I'm thinking. There were a few things when I was, you know, reading about you or looking at looking at different videos. Yes. One of the things that really hit me is because I wrote down just the word. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to hit it with the word. Freedom. Yeah. What is freedom to you? Well, when you say the word for me, freedom, I immediately immediately think of um, the inner self and the spirit. And uh, I think if you're... Your spirit has to feel free to express itself in any way it chooses, as long as it doesn't harm other people. So freedom is the ability to express yourself in any way that you want to, really. And that expression of yourself has to come from within. That's where freedom really is. We often can find ourselves censoring ourselves you know, I think it's very important to feel the freedom to express yourself. Um, and you know, and as Ethiopians, I think you've also learned that throughout 
you know, your visits or even meeting different Ethiopians. Yes. We're not one to totally express. We don't know how to really express ourselves. Yeah, it's it's complicated. Yeah. I think it's complicated in any culture, though, if, if I'm really honest. Mm. I think the deeper you go in, in a culture, there is a wisdom, I think, in holding the story. Mm. I have to share the story because of my situation. Mm. But actually, I see in families, lots of people holding a story. It doesn't need to be talked about, doesn't need to be, you know, explored. It needs to be held, you know? You no, know, I do. You know, in fact, sometimes <laughs> to tell the story out is to sort of somehow destroy the story, you know? Sometimes things that happen Spirit. inside families, trauma, etc. it needs to be held. Yeah. So expression is one thing, but actually holding and the wisdom of holding is, is another. That's well said. Thank you. You know, one of the things that, you know, of course now I'm going to be talking about, because I saw so many different things about you, and some of the things that really touched me or resonated with me, mm. you know, and one of it was when you were being, when your psychologist had you on stage with the audience and they were telling you for the wow, first time. Wow, yeah. yeah. So that to me was just amazing. I forgot that was in the film. Yeah. Wow. And I know. And it was really interesting, especially when I, and I think somebody asked you why you did that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you said, but I don't have anybody to tell me don't. Absolutely. Gosh, thank you for remembering that. Yeah. And it really Gosh, hit that's me. really good it's what really you, you remembered that. You said that. Yeah. That's the truth. Exactly. You know? Give me a family that says, don't, don't talk do about that. that. <laughs> you know, don't, know. Don't, what happens between these four walls is between us, you know. I, that's what, I didn't have that. And it made me realize how important it was to have that. Yeah. Oh, you see, when you share what you have not had, sometimes it helps people to realize what, what they have you know exactly. family can be really difficult you yeah. know but that's part of what family is and i didn't have that you know so thank you yeah yeah you, you made me see so many different elements and of course the other one was when you were uh talking about you know you're growing up and everything and somebody asked a question and you said it's okay i'm fine with it yeah I'm yeah, really yeah. okay yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, we live all our lives to be okay with it. Yeah. Even us, yeah, the ones that yeah, grew up with, you yeah, know, yeah, and we yeah, all have right. our own so issues. We all have our own stuff. But yeah. trying to get to where you are yeah. is what we're all yeah. living. Yes. And you have actually found a peaceful space. Yeah. You are a blessed man. <laughs> it's a daily project, right? Absolutely. It's a daily project. It's why. You know, it's why some people pray, it's why, you know, it's a daily project of, yeah, of understanding what's important. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might have taken you a while, but you still yeah. got there. And, yeah. I mean, we're still striving. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. That's yeah. yes. what I'm saying. And yeah. as humans, we're always, you know, judging or yeah. saying, if, yeah. you know, if he had done this instead of this, and, yeah. and, and yeah. even to ourselves. Manaman, manaman. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
And, you know, people were crying and people were laughing. And then we had a conversation afterwards, you know, and it was the same. It was emotional and powerful. And my friends were in the audience, Aster Zaud, my uncle, Daniel Estefanos, my best friend, Mesoret Fikru. I mean, it was beautiful. You were surrounded. Yeah, love. by love. I could feel it, feel actually, it. <laughs> yes. That was lovely. Yeah. I won't keep you because I know you have such a busy schedule and you're probably leaving soon. So my last, my last, my last, even though it's not my last, is, you know what's interesting? Is when I first moved to Ethiopia, uh, I love poetry. Mm. I had a bunch of poets and we mm. used to do gorilla poetry. We used to, nice. I would DJ, they would do, I would do nice. dub underneath. We would go to each, well, wherever we would pick up, we would go, we would just take over the bar. Nice. And we would do poetry. We did this for three years. Well, in Addis. In Addis. Nice, in man, Addis. I like that. Exactly. So Ethiopia actually has amazing poets. Oh, uh, look. <sighs> Don't, I, I, I'm 100%. You heard me talking last Absolutely. night, right? Absolutely. I sure did. I sure um, did. You know, I sure but did. I love the fact we have cutting edge, avant-garde mm -hmm. vibe going on here. Mm -hmm. I'd say the closest to that now is not Ras Hotel, which is a very, actually there's some great work that goes there every month with Misrak. Remember this, how the story washed across the continent, enslaved, flooded with the story of Adwa in a whispered tidal wave, from Kenya to Senegal, from Morocco to the Gambia, the liberation began in Adwa, 1896, and ended in South Africa. But Vendika, I would mm -hmm. say that they're Vendika pushing started. the boundaries and, yes. of, of poetry and, and music and uh, comedy, etc. So I, I know that the great poets are here, and my favorite uh, is Boketu Sayom, you know, because yeah, Boketu is amazing. Yes. Boketu is world class poet, you know. We have a great poetry scene here in. Uh, look, there's, at the Ras Hotel, there's 2,000 people come mm -hmm. to the gigs mm -hmm. every month. Oh, yeah. Okay, there's nowhere in England that does that. That does, yeah. That. No, we're, okay. we're serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we love our poets. Yeah. I am really enjoying yeah. promoting Ethiopian culture in England as well, I've got to say. You know, and that means supporting artists, putting, you know, on festivals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think, I, I personally feel that Ethiopia is breaking in the world uh, in a similar way to it did in the early 70s and the outside of England. So mm -hmm. that, then it was Bob Marley promoting Ethiopia. Exactly. You know, and I think you have many artists. I was at the Venice Biennale mm -hmm. this year, uh, curating um, the artist Tespai Urgesa, uh, who's just doing so well on the world stage. You know, Buketu Seum, I was at Brown University. Uh, that's where Buketu uh, goes to, um, to, to perform and to write. You have so much here. You know, Addis Fine Art uh, Gallery, uh, Elias Sime, I'm going to see him now. I think our art scene is... Yeah, yeah. I feel blessed to be accepted here because the art scene is so rich and productive and powerful. And I now feel, I feel blessed to be amongst, to be interviewed by you. Thank you. Today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now you know, we're on holiday, right? Yes. Right a week after Easter is Dag Maitensai. So Dag Maitensai is going to be on Sunday. Yes. And you know, asking you how you had your holidays, how you went through your holidays might be the wrong question. Yeah. But once you found out, and once you found out and we had all these yeah. <laughs> holidays in between, yes. uh, all these different days, Yes. How did you respond and how did you feel or how did you enjoy those days? Like, what did you do on Easter? The holiday is 
so important culturally to Ethiopians. Uh, Christmas and uh, Easter, etc. And Christmas is on a different day than it is in England to, to the one I grew up with. And I have watched and taken part at times the ceremonies of Easter, of going to the church and walking around the church and uh, walking out there on the streets, you know, uh, candles. And, uh, and I think that we are blessed with holidays which people around the world know about because exactly. they are so profound and so beautiful. This country is, is it still 50% Christian, 50% Muslim? And they live in relative peace. You, do. you know, we're a lesson to the world. And that's worth celebrating in the holidays. Beautiful. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to sit here and talk to you. You're famous. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in once again. I'm going to say this in Amharic. This is your Pan African show called Africa with your host Katsalaur Kaseifu. Thank you.